Hip to be square is the way that the pop song goes. Hip to be square. I think that was in the movie Back to the Future, back in the 1980s. But is it hip to be sober? <laughs> I'm the creator of the 30 Day No Alcohol Challenge. And my guest today is the creator of a blog and a program called Hip Sobriety. Hip Sobriety. It's hip to be sober. Is it really? Uh, I believe so. <laughs> well, our guest is. I haven't introduced you yet, but I'm going to introduce him now. <laughs> sorry. I'm oh, sorry that you were talking to me. That's okay. Holly Whitaker from Hip Sobriety. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you. So uh, you and I, by the sounds of it, have kind of similar stories in the sense that, um, well, my story is that I was a social drinker. I wasn't an alcoholic, but I was a social drinker. I had a few drinks during the week, had a few more on weekends. I got tired of feeling sick and tired. I took a 30 day break one day. Um, at the end of it, I felt amazing. I kept going. I haven't drunk since 2010. Uh, and my life is transformed. It's, it's a hell of a lot better. Uh, is that a similar kind of story to yours? What, what's your story in relation to alcohol? Well, first of all, I don't, I don't really identify with the whole, like, trying to split out what's an alcoholic, what's not. I just think there's, there's drinking and there's not drinking and there's problematic drinking and there's non-problematic drinking. But trying to, like, put a label on it is, is one of the things that I think keeps a lot of people from doing anything about their issues with alcohol. So that's the first thing I'll start off by saying. Mine was, my story was I started drinking when I was 15 and I never would say that I had a happy relationship with it. Um, I think that it was a lot of fun for me at the very beginning, but it wasn't very long before all of the stuff that comes along with drinking um, started to show up in my life. And so I, I never had a great relationship with it, but I also wasn't doing the like classical things we think of when we think of uh, addiction. Uh, for me, though, it I moved to San Francisco in, in 2006 and that accelerated my social drinking. Um, and also around 2009, I started doing um, benders at home on the weekends while I was working long hours um, just to make it through. And so like make it through like a, a weekend deadline. And then over time, that along with um, added eating disorders for years, um, I smoked a lot of pot, um, everything for me, um, I was working you know, ridiculous amounts, everything for me just uh, came undone around 2012. Um, and so I, I stopped drinking, I didn't work the program, I didn't work the steps, but I stopped drinking in, in 2012. Um, and I did it fairly easy uh, at first, uh, like just stopped drinking for 60 days and I did it through Alan Carr's method. I'm, do you know who? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. yeah. And that for me uh, was the game changer because all of a sudden, I think, I think most of us um, and, and uh, in America, at least I can speak for, I think we just have this idea that we have to drink. Um, and that there's something wrong with us if we can't handle alcohol. If it shows up negatively in our lives, then there's something wrong with us. And this, this framework, Alan Carr's work, really flipped it on its head and just allowed me to recognize the insanity of what it is to believe that we need to drink alcohol in order to have lives um, and how damaging that is to us individually and us societally. And so yeah. I was happy to stop drinking. I couldn't, I was like, sign me up. I went out. Um, yeah. And yeah, what well, just, uh, I've read the, uh, Alan Carr's book. It's um, uh, how to quit drinking now. I think it is. What was there's what, two. Yeah. There's two. There's one. The one I drank is called the easy way to control alcohol. The one, the one um, that you read, not the one you drank. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, no, but the the one that I read, I haven't read both of them, but there is a very distinct difference yeah. between the two. Of them. So, what was the what was the one underlying kind of message or framework, mental framework that you got out of that that helped you? Oh, that drinking is hell, and that not drinking is freedom. And the choice was, it wasn't about giving anything up. It wasn't about sacrifice. The choice was about uh, removing the thing that's keeping you from experiencing life, um, removing, removing, like claiming your freedom. Um, and that was the overlying thing. I was just, I, I had no freedom while I was drinking. And I never had. I'd never had freedom since the moment that I started drinking because mm. I believed from the moment I started drinking that it was necessary then to be able to um, 
go on dates, be able to be fun at parties, be able to commune. Um, and for me, it was like a, it was a total game changer. I went back to that place that I had just like wished I could go back to so many, like so many times I went back to the place before I needed a drink before mm. like drinking was part of my life. I like literally reclaimed that part of me that was, um, that I had lost when I was, you know, mm. 14, 15. Mm. Drinking is hell, not drinking is freedom. That's so interesting. I think for me, it was, it was never drinking is hell. I, I think for me, it was always drinking is holding me back. And, and that, that was- hell? Well, it, well, maybe it depends on how you look at it. I mean, I didn't realize that it, I, I never realized that it was hell. I don't think it was hell. I don't think it was like, like a disaster the way that I was drinking. It was just, I wasn't living the best life that I, that I could live because I was tired and lethargic and I wasn't sleeping well. So I wasn't clear in mind. So because I wasn't clear in mind, I wasn't making as much money and my relationships weren't as good. But it wasn't yeah. like I ever was like, oh my God, this is hell. My life sucks. You know, I was prone to that, to those kind of thoughts at times. But generally speaking, I was all right. You know, like things, things were okay. I was born to good parents. I, like, I, I wasn't addicted to the drinking. I, I was traveling around the world. I was doing cool things. It was generally speaking, I was, it was okay. So I didn't seem like it was hell, but it wasn't it wasn't great. It certainly wasn't free. <laughs> as you said, I could probably, I could probably relate more to the, to the, the second part of it, which is not drinking is freedom. I, I can relate to that. Certainly. Yeah. yeah. Well, it is. I mean, it's, um, God in so many different ways. It really is. So tell me a little bit about how the not drinking became freeing for you. I would say it was freeing immediately. Um, there was something about going, I went out immediately. Um, I went out, like I stopped drinking on a Monday and I, you know, there was this like overwhelming sense of I'm too old to be doing this anymore. Like I just, um, I just felt like something I had, you know, I'd missed some part of growing up and there was something just so beautiful about going out that first night and watching everyone else get inebriated and not, um, you know, and, and there's that, right. Which is just like having this amazing confidence that comes along with being able to stand on your own and not do what the whole pack is doing. Um, and, and then this, all these other things just lead into it. It's not thinking about not, you know, not recovering from it, you know, the many, many physical side effects that come with it. Um, remembering everything that happens to you, um, being able to go into a social setting and own who you are and like be yourself without having to use a crutch like everyone else. Um, you know, walking into a social scene and your first thing not being, I need a drink or let, let's, you know, like it's just, it's like removing this thing that you didn't, this wet blanket you didn't realize that you had like over your life um, in, in every situation. I mean, from dating to like having sex to, uh, making friendships to, uh, I mean, just every, it touches every corner of your life. Um, and, and just removing it, just, it's like shedding a, shedding a layer. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I remember when I first, when I first quit, I was in Austin, Texas. It was 2010. I was at the South by Southwest festival and I woke mm -hmm. up with a hangover. Um, and I went to an IHOP, an international house of pancakes next door to this hotel I was staying in. And the sight of those menus in the IHOP with the big bright colors. And there were these big kind of like, um, uh, overweight, uh, uh, obese, is it obesely overweight? I'm not sure if that's the phrase, but there were like very large people sitting in the IHOP eating all you can eat pancakes with maple syrup and whipped cream. And that sight combined with my hangover was the moment where I was like, you know what? It's time I took a break. I'd put on a few pounds. Um, I, I looked weathered. Um, yeah. I looked weathered. I mean, it dries out your skin. I'm going to show you a, a photo of how I looked back then, uh, Holly. And if you're, if you're listening on the podcast, you can certainly see this on the video version, which is on my YouTube channel, um, which is James Swanick. Or if you might be watching this on the video version of the podcast as well, because I release video and audio. But I'll try and, as I keep talking, I'll try and locate this, uh, this I call it the fat face photo. <laughs> it mm. was the photo of me um, when I was drinking. 
But when I, uh, when I finished, when I quit drinking and I felt so amazing after 30 days, I'd lost 13 pounds of fat. My skin got better. My looks improved. Uh, I had more energy and clarity. And I just went, you know what? I'll just, I'll just keep on going. But on the first, the first couple of weeks that I went out, friends tried to put vodka in my drink. They're like, go on, here you go. Like, they're like, oh, do you want a drink? I go, yeah, grab me a soda water. And they'd come back and hand me the drink. And they would have, you know, thought they were very clever. And they would have, they put vodka in the damn thing. And I went to put it to my mouth. And I went, did you put vodka in this? And my friend who did it was like, oh, yeah, I did. Like he was laughing like it, like it was a big joke. And I, got, I mean, I was pissed. I was pissed. Well, because your friends are trying to slip you drugs. That's the first thing. Second thing, it's like, it's this whole tribe mentality. People really, like, once you start to, it's so, it's such a big deal of this. This is why quitting drinking, it's not just physiological and psychological, it's societal. You quit drinking, the whole tribe is like, wait a minute. Um, you know, you're basically like, uh, like you're the crab trying to run out of the pot and all the other crabs stack on top of each other to pull you back in because you're violating the social contract that you have with these people. We get fucked up together. Oh, can I? I'm sorry. We get messed up together. So it's yeah, it's uh, it's not surprising. It's um, awful, but it's not surprising. Yeah, well, they're actually this tribal mentality. It's it goes back to um, cavemen days. Actually, when um, back in the day we were in we were in tribes of say like 100, 120 people. I think Dunbar's number is 120, uh, and so. If you were ostracized from the tribe back when we roamed the land and, and um, we were cavemen, cavewomen, we were on the African mainlands, whatever it is that, um, you know, whatever time in history we were doing that, if you were uh, ostracized from the tribe, it was like certain death. You would because die. You, because you would get either killed by a rival tribe or you'd get eaten by a bear yeah. or a wolf or you'd just, you know, you, you, you could die. You'd just die. You would just <laughs> yeah. die. Yeah. And, and so uh, there's an example of that. Did you ever watch that M. Night Shyamalan movie called The Village back in like uh, oh, yeah, I did. 2001? Oh, and there was yeah. a character who was a little bit um, mentally uh, affected. Mentally ill. He was what? Mentally ill. Yeah, he was, men he was mentally ill. And do you remember he, um, he stabbed uh, Joaquin Phoenix's character, and so he got ostracized from from the tribe. He got sent yeah. off into the village, into the, into the woods, and you can see him like he's there by himself. Now he doesn't have this community. Now he doesn't have any support base. It's just him in the woods. Yeah, um, that's what it was like. That's yeah. what it was like. And so fast forward to today, and as we're recording this, it's 2016. Um, anything that threatens the tribe we have this innate fear of it's like oh if i quit drinking i'm no longer going to be part of the tribe maybe i'll be ostracized from the tribe and maybe i'll die now even though rationally that's ridiculous on a subconscious level a deep reptilian part of the human brain level we still have that fear that if we don't toe the line if we don't go along with the tribe we'll somehow be left to, to fend for ourselves and be, be kicked out of the tribe yeah. Um, the only difference is, or the big difference is that today, if you get kicked out of the tribe, you can just join another tribe. That's right. It's called, well, that's a big part of it, right? Like that's, I mean, when you, the people fear when people are looking to quit drinking, the thing, you know, the question and the fears that come up the most are what are other people going to think? Um, and what am I going to lose in this, in this? And, and you're exactly right. It's tied up with our survival instinct. It's to, it's, you know, the, the thought of being rejected by our peer group or, or, um, not no longer fitting within our peer group. It's, 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 it is a real and, and big fear. And it's because of exactly that. Like this is, it's one of the ways that we survive in this world. And then if you uh, put on top of that, just your sense of identity, like drinking, and you know this very well. Drinking was part of your identity. This is part of who you were in this world. And that's another survival instinct is creating this distinct and separate identity. And so when you go to quit drinking, you're losing your identity, at least the identity that you'd had up to that point, because it is a shift in identity. And then you're also stand to lose this tribe that you surrounded yourself with. And so it's this huge, I mean, the amount of the amount of hang up on that one point for people is enough to keep them from 
not even went in to to try it in the first place right yeah it's it's insanity um i found the uh the photo you want to check this out holly yeah i'd love to there you go not bad oh well maybe it's not bad bad. that's the before and after so if you're listening i'm 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 showing my i mean the thing that strikes me the most is you don't you don't look um as bright as you do your eyes look different that's what i always see in these pictures is how people's eyes look different yeah well you can see there in the photo uh, of when i was drinking um i'm bloated like i just i look puffy around the face, you know, like I, I look weathered. That's the word, yeah. weathered. It's just yeah. tired. It's a tired yeah. look. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's ingesting rocket fuel. <laughs> I mean, it's it's it's. There's no health benefits to drinking whatsoever. It's literally the same thing as ingesting what we put into our cars. Okay, so the listener is going. Oh, but hang on a second. I read that article that says drinking a glass of wine a day is actually good for your heart, and it's really good for you one article there's like one study that's been done to prove that and then there's all these other studies that show how much it links to cancer and how like how even small amounts and and by the way nobody drinks that amount that they talk about in that article at least nobody that's running around and saying i drink because of the health benefits is doing that we all like say we drink because of the health benefits but nobody ever drinks the amount that is actually listed in that one study but then there's all these other studies that talk about how it kills you slowly over time. I mean, it kills like one in 10, one in 10. It's the third leading cause of preventable death, but everyone holds on to that one article. And by the way, those benefits that you can get from that one, that one, whatever, like four ounce glass of red wine with preserved all in it, you can get that same health benefit from doing a meditation practice. Like a five minute meditation practice will do the same thing for your stress levels and your heart that that, you know, one messed up study that really only I think applies to like men in a certain age group. Anyways, it's crazy. But yeah, people will look for that confirmation bias. They look for the, they look for the thing that will say it's okay to do what I'm doing, even though a part of us knows it's, it's not working. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> it is insanity how many people point to that article. One, one, one study, that one study and everyone knows it, you know, but like the, just, there was just released, they just released updates on the number of cancers and percentage of cancers that are related to alcohol, like breast cancer. And nobody knows about that one. (laughs) Like no one. Excuse me. And um, the interesting thing is that uh, it takes seven to 10 days for the toxins from alcohol to actually leave your body. The National Institute of Health um, said that even if you have a if you have a glass of wine tonight or a vodka or a beer or whatever, seven to ten days those toxins are hanging out in your body. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Do you think? No, it is. I mean, it's it is. It's one of the worst things that people can do for themselves. It is. It's like been listed as the most dangerous drug. You know, there's all there's all sorts of like com- compelling evidence that talks about it. I mean, it's literally listed as the most dangerous drug in the world, above heroin and above crack. Um, but the the thing with it is it's so normalized. I mean, it's like we don't look at it as a drug. We look at it as like the like, but alcohol is okay. But um, you know, and it's expected that we drink. It's weird that we don't drink. And so it's just you know, it's this whole it's this whole crazy thing that our culture has gotten into. But I'm assuming you've noticed this since you started your thing that there is a shift, that there is a lot of, you know, there's hello Sunday morning and there's one year no beer and there's what you're doing and there's a lot of rising consciousness. And I feel very similar about this and I I feel very similar about alcohol um, or uh, I feel very, uh, the hell am I trying to say? I feel alcohol is very similar to cigarettes in that I feel like there's a rising consciousness around this and that over time, it is going to be less and less and less uh, the socially acceptable thing that we just all drink, um, and that it's going to be this, the socially acceptable thing that, that we don't drink, and it will seem odd for those that drink. I have this, I mean, in my heart of hearts, this is where I believe things are going, and you can't help but notice all these different things that are coming up where people are like, I stopped drinking, and my life, you know, I finally like, got everything I wanted in my life. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? 
I mean, I see it. I, I, I see it myself. I agree with you. Um, I don't think it's going to catch on mainstream to the extent that you, that you hope. Um, I think it's going to be like one of those things. Like I have another business, um, Swanick Sleep, and we, we, I, I produce these blue light blocking glasses. And only now, after like a number of years, are people starting to catch on to the idea that blue light that is emitted from your cell phone and from your TV screen and from your computer screen is disrupting your melatonin production and is messing with your sleep patterns. Um, a lot of people have known about it for a lot of years, um, right. but they're only just, you know, people are only just starting to, to figure it out. And it's really only in the biohacking community at the moment. It's not a mainstream thing, even though Apple has brought out a, a setting on their phone called night shift where you can reduce the brightness level of, of, of that blue light. It still hasn't really caught on. And I think it's going to be the same with alcohol. I think it's going to take some time, but we'll see yeah. little patches and the movement just gathering a little bit of steam, but it'll take a, a many years. I watched um, Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio's documentary that was released on national geographic channel recently called after the flood. And uh, he's talking about global warming, you know, and the dangers of, of, of what we're doing to the planet. And it was very interesting. Um, you might think we've only been talking about this for 10 or 15 years, global warming. But he actually showed a, a clip from a 1950s um, video where the guy was so, talking about um, all of the use of our cars and, um, and, and coal and energy and stuff is cre is is causing our planet to, to heat up. And if we don't do something about it, then we're going to lose ice in the Antarctic and blah, blah, blah. This is from like 60 years ago. So people, would, right. people knew about it 60 years ago and still we're fighting over whether it's true, whether it's not true. Like, so I, I, I love your, your positive outlook that this, this will, will catch on, but I think it's going to be a lot, a lot slower and what we both hope. Right, but global warming is not an, it's not impacting me individually. Global warming, me specifically, personally, right now, as I'm sitting here in my apartment in LA, is not affecting me. Like, I can't see it right now. It's not making my life really shitty. Alcohol, on the other hand, is a very individual thing, and people are personally motivated, right? Mm -hmm. And I think over time, the more and more people that start coming out with their stories, lifting the veil of anonymity, and also starting to introduce this broad spectrum, right? Like you just, you started off the podcast by saying, I'm not an, I wasn't an alcoholic, but I was, you know, drinking 50 in America alone, 51 million people fall into the, that category into the spectrum of people that have some sort of disordered drinking in some way or it, it's impacting their lives negatively. Um, 51 million Americans, you go into a room, three out of 10 people. Uh, it's so anyways, what I'm saying is that you, this is, it's not the same as global warming, which I think is just going to end up. <laughs> and it's not the same as sleep disruption. It's something where it is, it's in, it's one of those things that I do believe when we start to actually look at it and, and like lift the veil and see that, Oh, we've been drinking ethanol um, and we've been teaching our kids to drink it. We've been taking drugs and start looking at this in a different way. Um, because one thing Americans want, they want to look good. They want a good life. They want a big life. And I do believe that over time, it's one of these things that is going to catch on and be a much different. We're going to have much different attitudes towards alcohol. Um, I, I firmly believe this. We're talking to Holly Whitaker, who is the creator of the Hip Sobriety blog. You can check it out at hipsobriety.com. I'm having a look here at your Hip Sobriety manifesto, Holly. Uh, let's go over these, shall we, one by one? Um, you've oh, got, sure. You've got 11, 11 kind of like uh, laws here, I guess, or 11 kind of ideas. Number one says you do not need to hit rock bottom. Just explain that for us. Did you hit rock bottom? I mean, I don't know. I didn't know. I don't think I did. I yeah. don't think I did. We have I an idea in our bottom. minds. Yeah, no, we, we have an idea in our minds that you have to be this like, we, I mean, you, if you look, most people don't, don't start working on addiction or alcohol issues until, um, until they check off all the boxes on that questionnaire. Are you an alcoholic? And all of our resources that are dedicated to helping people recover and stop drinking are dedicated to that in spectrum. They're dedicated to this very far off, it's, you know, the guy on the street with the brown paper bag. 
this is who our resources are dedicated to, this is what our idea is of somebody that needs to stop drinking. We don't understand that there's a spectrum um, and that that man with the brown paper bag um, started out as something else. We think there's a very, there's a very othering like, thing going on here when it comes to alcohol. And so this is based, this is just you. You are the person that didn't hit rock bottom. You are the person that decided this is not working in my life. And maybe you hit your own personal bottom, right? Like I, for me, a bottom is the moment that you can actually start telling the truth to yourself. Mm. Um, and that you don't have to lose everything and do this stereotypical, you know, like two DUIs, lost my wife, like lost my job, lost my car. You don't have to do this stereotypical idea of what we view as somebody that has lost their life to addiction in order to remove alcohol from your life. You can actually stop um, the moment that you can start telling the truth to yourself about whether or not it's doing you a favor. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. Okay. Um, let's move on to the next one. Everything you want starts here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you start doing the work to remove alcohol from your life, you like we use alcohol for, for one thing, one thing, it's, it's a coping mechanism, right? I mean, a lot of us will say we use it to socialize. That's a coping mechanism. That's allowing you to do something you otherwise feel you couldn't do. But it is, alcohol is a coping mechanism and it's like a mask. It's something that we use and to the, you know, varying degrees for me, using alcohol was, um, it was, it was how I, it was at the end, how I felt I had to do most things. Um, and so when we do something like that, when we numb our experience in our life, when we numb our experience, we numb the pain or numb any other reality of it. We also numb the bigness of our lives. And so when we do this one thing and we actually start to look at this thing that's holding us back and look at like, uh, and take away the coping mechanism, then we're actually left with our real life. And at that point, this is when we actually start to do the real work, right? This is when we actually have to rely on our own, like our, on what we were naturally given, on our own inheritance. Um, and also we start removing the numbing agent and so we actually get to experience life. Um, and the amount of like self-empowerment that comes with this, like I can do this, um, it starts to lead to so many other things. Like for me, it was, I quit drinking, then I quit smoking pot, then I quit smoking cigarettes, then I stopped binging and purging, right? So these like low level things, not low level things, but this like low hanging fruit of how I was killing myself. But then I started to say like, okay, if I can do that, like I've also had this longing to have my own company. I've also had this longing to travel extensively. I've also, um, you know, I mean, it just like opens up the world of possibilities when you do this one thing that to be honest, most people feel that they can't do. What you did, most people, I'm sure you've heard this time and again, like are amazed by the fact that you don't drink. Am I right? I mean, it, they're amazed. It's because so people boring, think they it, can't do it. But it's so boring. It's so boring to me now when people are so amazed. It's it like, and I don't mean that as disrespect to people, but I'm like, I'm just like, really? It's like, oh man, it's like I don't need to have alcohol to fit in. For God's sake, right. it's like I'm so like, I haven't drunk in almost seven years. I feel amazing. I'm happy. Right. everything's cool and you know what here's the other thing holly oh, this is what i will say if i drink again it's okay if i go back to having the occasional drink for me it's all right just yeah. like people who take my 30 day no alcohol challenge i don't tell them that alcohol is the devil and you should never drink alcohol again i don't say that right i say listen quit for 30 days see how you feel and if you like it just keep staying quit and if you want to go back to drinking, then go back to drinking. And people who do go back to drinking, Holly, usually go back at a far reduced rate than what they were drinking beforehand. So it's I'm harm not reduction. A, what's that? Sorry. <laughs> it's harm reduction. Yeah, mean, it's, you're giving people a, an option away from abstinence only. Right. Um, so I, you know, look, I might, I might go back, I might go back to Australia and Christmas and catch up with some friends on a Sunday afternoon and go and watch the cricket and someone might offer me a 4X beer or a Foster's beer or something and I might just go, yeah, what the hell? It's been seven years. I'll have a beer and I'll drink it and that'll be okay. And I'll tell my community and I'll say, yeah, I had a beer and I'll tell the experience. It's not like I'm all of a sudden I'm a failure because I had a drink again. It's not the devil. It's just if it is affecting you, if it is holding you back, if it is slowing you down, if it is causing you depression, if you are feeling trapped, if you feel like you're using it for a crutch, for a social crutch, then 
it's possibly the devil. But if you feel like you can enjoy the occasional drink and you genuinely enjoy the taste and it's okay, then it's okay. That's what I say. I don't, I don't know if I agree with all that. And first, like, first I want to say, because I don't think that everybody can just go back and forth. I work with a lot of people that might've been, you know, not drank for 14 years and then that drink again. And it does end up like putting them into a, you know, a shitty back and forth. And so I don't think that everybody can just be as, as free with it. Um, I know that I, I can never drink again. I'm never going to drink again. I never want to drink again. So I don't have that attitude towards it. I do have the attitude. I do believe that people are allowed to figure out their own path and that we have a very, very messed up idea of what relapse means or what, what drinking means after you've tried to stop or you have stopped for some period of time. I think there needs to be a huge, like that's a, a huge area that needs to be overhauled because it's not failure. Um, and it's not, you don't go back to where you started. Like if you were to drink right now, it wouldn't mean that you've lost any sort of um, um, changes that you've made, um, you go forward. And so, but I do believe that, I mean, for me, I don't, I think that it's one of those things, like the, one of the most painful parts um, and it is the cognitive dissonance, which is, the, which happens to a lot of people. And I think these entry points are really great. Like try it on, see how it works. I think like, um, you know, I think harm reduction is great, drink less. But I do know when we get into this place, just from experience, and I've worked with now over 600 people, right? Like specifically in a coaching program to help people quit drinking um, intimately. And I understand one of the parts that makes this really hard for people is this, I want it, I don't want it, I want it, I don't want it, I want it, I don't want it. And one of the things that was the most freeing part for me was just never questioning it, was just getting to a point where... I no longer had to think about it, right? Like I, not thinking, am I going to drink when I go home on the holidays? Am I going to drink at that brunch? Um, because that for a lot of people ends up being one of the hardest parts, which is thinking about it and the obsession that can come along with that. Am I going to drink tomorrow night or not? You know, uh, how, how much is everybody else drinking? Like the thinking about it is the part that I have freedom from. I never think about it. Never think about it, ever. Never think about it. And that's because I'm never going to do it again. Um, well, I, so never I, don't know. I never think about it either, but I can also confidently say that if I have another drink again, it's okay. I mean, I don't. That's you, that. but that's you. That's not somebody sure. that is like gone. I mean, addiction is a progressive thing. And once it like starts to rewire your brain, once you create specific neural connections in your brain, they never go away, mm -hmm. right? They never go away. So if you have, and, and brain, and when you get into addiction itself, not what causes addiction, but addiction specifically, the way the brain is, is, is connected, you never, like it changes the wiring of your brain. Um, and your brain is plastic and you can change and, and I change and many, many people change the wiring of their brain, but those networks lay dormant. And if you had, if you were in a, like a serious addiction with it, um, it's, it doesn't just go away. All of those things, all of those things that came together that created that construct within your brain, um, they don't go away. Mm. This is why some people years later can like, I don't know, for me, I can like on a warm day, um, you know, just for a second, forget and like, cause different senses come together to remind me of what it was to have a beer at a barbecue on a warm day. Um, those things don't go away. And so I think for some, for some people, you know, for you, you said at the beginning, like you were just socially drinking too much. It wasn't, you know, and, and that's fine. Um, but for a lot of people, they're looking for that, um, that like that, oh, I, you know, like I can do this. And for a lot of people, they just can't, you can't mess with it anymore. You just like, I, like for me, I could go out and have cocaine. No problem. Never had a really big thing with cocaine. Um, I could take a line and I'd be done. But with alcohol, with pot, with cigarettes, it wouldn't work that way for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I never pretended to be, and I still don't pretend to be a doctor. I don't pretend to be anything other than what I am, which is someone who considered himself to be a social drinker who quit one day and learned how to stay quit and not yeah. have it a big issue. So I always say to, to people who follow me, um, either as, you know, if, if they're an official member of the 30 day, no alcohol challenge, or if they're just following me on my Instagram page where I do a lot of memes and, and sort of inspirational stuff around drinking. Um, if you believe yourself to be more than just, you know, 
a social drinker and you feel like you're seriously addicted, go out and seek professional help or go and go somewhere else, like try somewhere else. Because I, I personally, I cannot relate to the addicted drinker. Like there's someone who's like full on alcoholic because I don't ever feel like that I was that person. So, um, I'm saying, you know, I don't think drinking is the, is the devil. I'm saying that from my own perception of how I drank for the first 35 years. Well, the, well, actually, I wasn't drinking since I was a baby. I started drinking since I was 17. But for about 17 or 18 years that I was drinking until I stopped. So uh, I think there's a lot of different ways to help different types of people, depending on what their relationship right. is with alcohol. I just okay. say in, in my 30 day no alcohol challenge, this is a way for you to re-explore your relationship with alcohol. And then from yeah. there, you figure out what works best, what doesn't work best. Alan's, Alan Carr's book works for some people, other people it just doesn't. Alcoholics Anonymous, some people need Alcoholics Anonymous. They have to go there, they have to have a 12 step program. They have to say, my name's James and I'm an alcoholic in order for them to really go through. It sure as hell wouldn't have worked for me. It doesn't sound like it would work for you. I know lots of people have gone there and said they hated it, didn't, didn't work for them. So I'm not pretending that mine is the answer to fit every scenario, but I am saying it's the answer for many, for many people in, in, in a certain scenario. But like anything, try lots of things. Like you said, Hello Sunday Morning is good. Check out hipsobriety.com. You can check out my 30 Day No Alcohol Challenge. Alan Carr's uh, book, uh, books are very good. Um, yeah. But just get into the conversation though, because... Yeah. Otherwise, you just you just slowly killing killing yourself. Well, that's the point. Is it's just and and I don't I, I I didn't mean to come off and say your way is wrong. I'm just all I'm saying is making that very clear um, that one very clear point that that's not the case for many people. Um, but I think I think entry points are really important. A lot of the reasons that people don't a lot of the reasons that addiction progresses or it gets to a progressive state is because people don't look at it. Right. There's no there's no stops. There's no speed bumps along the way. There's no like uh, safe place for people to examine their relationship and something like what, regardless of how far along you are, something like a 30 day challenge gives you that space to be able to observe and see how, what your relationship is with that. It gives it in this US an assessment point so that you can then go out and triage yourself and do what you feel. But the people really need this this they need the space to be able to explore it without stigma yeah. they need the space to be able to be like to be able to do it and not feel like it's the end of their lives or the end of the world or that they're other um i think it's wonderful i think it's wonderful what you're doing it's well we're so on necessary. the we're on the uh we're on the homeward stretch here let's do the last few things here i see number eight nine ten and eleven number eight of your mm -hmm. manifesto is failure is a good thing uh, number nine is that your hangovers go away and your social life doesn't. Just because yeah. you stop drinking does not mean your life ends. On the contrary, your life is just beginning. You can still yes. do things you love to do before. <laughs> the only difference is that you have natural, real self-confidence to aid you, real happiness to support it, and you remember everything. Just explain that a little bit, Holly. Well... Which part of it? The whole thing? I mean, yeah, you're just, a lot of people worried, like we talked about, of losing their social life. They're really worried that I was only fun when I was drunk. They're really worried that like that, that was where they got their edge from. Um, like for me, I drank whiskey meats and I lived in San Francisco and I went to fancy dinners with wine pairing and all of my social life was, I mean, even, you know, baby showers, everything was wrapped up into alcohol and also this idea of who I was when I drank. Um, and my connections had been made through alcohol. So a lot of this, this, the fear that we have around uh, quitting drinking is that we're not, we're going to be boring um, and we're going to lose our edge um, and that we also are not going to have, like, we're not going to be able to experience the things that we experienced before. And it's just not true. I mean, there is a period of adjustment. Like for me personally, there was a period of adjustment. Um, I still went out, but for, there is, my friendships have changed. Um, but the thing that's been the most surprising is that my edge has remained and I haven't lost that part of me, that like rebellious part of me. It just finds healthier channels to come out because you cannot fundamentally change your, like you cannot, rem removing alcohol does not remove what was in you to begin with that had that social life, 
that had that sense of humor, that had all of those things that you were attributing to alcohol, that ability to connect with people. Um, it's just a mask. It's just a shortcut and a cheap shortcut. And so the bonus here is that you do something that no, that not a lot of people are doing, right? You start not drinking and you kind of have to start relying on this natural thing here and your own self-confidence. Um, and then you begin to accumulate more self-confidence because you were doing this thing that no one else is doing. And because you like have to stand on your own two feet without a mask. And then over time, it just becomes this, it's, it's rich. And so for me, my everything when it comes to social is better. Um, I haven't lost anything that wasn't worth losing. Uh, and a lot of people have this very, 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 uh, this idea that you just go off into a corner and you die and you just stay in your corner and you watch movies and, you know, you find some friends and you laugh, you know, like, ha, ha, ha. It's just like, it's not like that. It's so much bigger. Well, thank you so much, Holly. Thank you for those inspiring words. Make sure you check out Holly Whitaker's uh, blog. It's hipsobriety.com. Uh, this amazing uh, content there. Uh, where else can we find you, Holly? I'm, uh, I do a podcast called Home Podcast, and you can find us at homepodcast.org. Um, and I post quite frequently on Instagram, and I'm just hip sobriety on Instagram. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. It's been awesome. Yeah, thank you for inspiring people and keep doing what you're doing, Holly. And uh, to you, the listener, and to the viewer, thank you for listening and watching. Uh, and we'll catch you on the next one. See you.